Investing insights with Right Property Group. Exploring trends in real estate and helping property investors gain financial security. G'day everyone, it's Phil Tarrant here. How are you going? Our co-host of Investing Insights at Right Property Group. I'm joined by my regular co-host, Victor Kumar and Stephen Waters from the Right Property Group. Gentlemen, how are you going? You well? Great to be back. Going fantastic. Good, Phil. Wow, you're optimistic. Great to be back. Well, it's been a month <laughs> since we saw you this last. This is the highlight of the month, right? <laughs> Why is it so great? Is it great to be in property at the moment? It's just great to be alive. Great to be alive. You, you, put you, it can, you can tell right? that it's a birthday soon. That's why it's great to be alive. He's starting to talk all those rhetorics. He's getting older. <laughs> well, I'm not as old as you. <laughs> Who is old? Is you old? He's way old. I'm more senior than him. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yeah. You, you don't look a day over twenty, Victor. No, of yeah. course not. It's, it's all, the, all the spices in the carver. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, moving right along. Now, it's um, I've been looking forward to the chat since the last time we got together. There's been an interest rate cut, Victor. I don't know if you've seen it on the television or the newspaper that uh, we are now in one of the lowest interest rate environments, or it is the lowest rate interest rate environment ever. 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 Were you surprised when um, this information got handed down earlier this month? As you know, um, mm-hmm. the Reserve Bank meets the first Tuesday of every month and they tell Australia what they're doing. So mm-hmm. they dropped it down another 25 basis points. That's right. And it's been flagged quite significantly with most um, pundits out there that there would be an interest rate cut and there would more likely be a few more. It does bode a bit about the economy in itself, because really to regulate the economy or kickstart the economy, there are a couple of things only that we can do. One is interest rates. The other is spending money on infrastructure and making finance really easy. So I think we are firing all guns and we do need to look at, okay, yes, it's great for property investors. It's great for holding onto properties when the interest rates are lower, but we need to also look at, okay, what's the long-term play when interest rates are lower, is one, it good or bad? The one thing you guarantee is that interest rates will go up at some mm-hmm. point in time, so you need to plan for the future. And I think that should help us shape our conversation today. And, you know, yes, money is very, very cheap at the moment. There's opportunities there for property investors, but there's some other moving parts as well, um, whether or not it's a good time for Australia, whether the economy is in great health and um, there's opportunities there for all investors or what the future holds. We'll get stuck into that day. But before we do, remember to stick around to the end of the podcast. We've got a great giveaway for those listeners to get some really cool stuff to help you track your portfolio a bit more of that later on. Steve, rate cut, yes. Uh, APRA, so I hear, around the uh, the traps, uh, is uh, recommending to banks to start loosening some of their serviceability criteria to make it a little bit easier for property investors to get mortgages. And what we're talking about here is rather than looking at your serviceability at seven plus percent interest rates, they're sort of talking about bringing it down to six or south of six. You across all these changes, uh, what do they mean? Well, it means finance is potentially going to be easier. So it's two to two and a half percent above the retail rate is how they're going to assess now. And what that very loosely means is that potentially there's 10% more capacity or top line figure to borrow, which will make a huge difference. But I don't think we can lose sight of the fact that the banks are still going to forensically look at your accounts and they're going to need to have all that information collated and still determine whether you're a good risk or a bad risk to, to mm-hmm. lend the money to. So whilst it'll have some effect, it'll still be hard to get. So this is talking about it's really cheap money. Interest rates are all-time low and some of the lenders, not all of them, are passed on the full amount of those interest rate cuts. So people are getting some pretty sharp mortgage rates right now, mm. you know, three, low threes, mid threes, which is really good. So money's cheap. It's going to get easier, and I say that in inverted commas, to, to borrow money. So should every property investor be rushing in and getting their property right now? Because I was looking at the um, the results over the weekend on auction clearance rates mm. and whether or not that's a fair barometer of the state of the property market. You can argue against that. But you've had a, a number of consecutive weekends of very strong auction results. So mm. either there's heaps of buyers there and not much stock, therefore the, the auction rates are, are high or probably just flying out the door because you've got property investors and owner occupiers all trying to jag themselves a bargain before markets change significantly. So should we be jumping in right now? Well, just back on the auction rates for, for a little bit, there are some areas of, throughout Sydney that reached 100% clearance and some were 90s and some were 60s. So there is a bit of a spread there, but I saw a headline saying that we're heading back to 80% clearance rates. And We've talked about it before where the auction results tend to be a barometer of the health of the market and it shouldn't be looked at that way because there's multiple different areas that are experiencing auction results. But I think if we look at or we try to find the reasons as to why the auction rates are good and why there's a little bit of consumer confidence back in the market and perhaps properties are starting to ebb upwards, it's not just because of the amount of people coming back into the market because that is increasing, but it's also the amount of listings 
on the market, people, the vendors are holding on to their stock throughout the areas yes. that we're investing, waiting for the prices to increase before they put their property on the market. So you've got these two bookends, if you will, of conflicting data being that listings are down but prices are up. So where's the friction point then? So, you know, we're talking about auction rates are high. One way to view it is auction rates are high because there's people want to buy and there's not enough stock in the market, therefore it's clearing, right? So mm. when are we going to start people going, now is the time to start listing my property for sale? And, and what's going to... Going Traditionally, to it's around spring. Yeah, people will probably mm-hmm. say, well, let's let's dump the, the properties back onto the market in spring mm. and we'll see a rush of listings there. But I think it'll be more around how the agent educates the sellers into when to, they should put their properties on the market, but also what they're starting to see in the media in terms of prices are rising and we should take advantage of that now because it'll only take one little bit of bad news and you know, perhaps the whole sentiment piece will change again. And while rates are going down and potentially money will be easier to get, yet we still can't sort of forget the fundamentals and, and the reasons as to why the property markets did contract and go sideways to begin with. Well, so- if you look at the headlines of January, December, January. It was doom and gloom and the property market was absolutely tanking. And we look at the headlines now, the headlines are pretty buoyant. And the property market, whilst it is driven by finance, it's also driven by media sentiment as well. And more so pronounced these days because of social media as well, because we we are able to get instant news. And usually it's the... um, if we're not going to doom and gloom, it's the hope story that, you know, it, it's going to go up. It, it is going up. And, there's no and middle ground, is it? No one no ever goes. Ground. There's no. never a story never. that says property is just as it should be. Yeah, it, it just, it's just, yeah, it's going to do the average and everyone be happy. No, and yeah. because we, we've always said that there is obviously the property clock and there's a thousand different versions of it, but there's also the media clock that you overlay mm. onto the property clock. Mm-hmm. And as you say, Vic, that because of social media and the various platforms now about instant information, it's potentially easier to influence a market, if you will. Yeah, and this is the question, Victor, around the impact of this environment mm-hmm. right now. So this environment, to, and we've spoken a little bit about it over the last couple of podcasts, you've got now, you've got certainty around who the government's going to be yep. for the next foreseeable future, at least mm-hmm. three years, maybe six years. But that's beyond, we know what's going on now mm-hmm. and we know the rules and regulations for property investors. We know what they are. Yes. We know... APRA has made these recommendations to soften serviceability so Mm -hmm. people are going to have greater capacity to borrow and therefore it might be easy to borrow. And then also you've got really, really low interest rates and you've got a whole bunch of people who, and Australia's love affair of property, they all want to get into property. So this impact of this this environment is probably quite unique. We haven't been here for for quite some time um, or if ever. So what do we do about it? Is this the impact a positive thing or a negative thing? Look, if just when things are easy to get, people do – Overcommit, and that that's one of the things that will actually uh, derail a lot of people when money is really cheap and it's it gets easier to get to. You'll find a lot of property uh, people are overcommitting on their properties. In other words, if they can afford a let's say million dollar property, they'll push themselves up to one point two mil as an example, without taking into account that whilst we are at the lowest interest rates ever, and with the potential still to go in even lower, it will then go up again. Um, as the economy improves, as the brakes need to be put back on, the interest rates will start going up again. And this is where most people will more than likely hurt themselves financially if they're not forecasting that in their own scenario in terms of, yes, interest rates are at your mid-threes right now, but what if it did actually go up to, let's say, 5%? Can I afford to hold on to my portfolio? Or am I getting into assets or properties that are, going to be a bit too negative. In other words, the spread between the interest rate that you're getting and the rent that you're getting, is that too large, especially when you've got a higher interest rate climate coming in? So if you look at assessment rates as an example, Westpac and and most banks, 7.29 was the previous assessment rate. Westpac at the moment has 5.75. So that's a significant drop Mm. in in the assessment rate. So regardless of whether you're borrowing at 3.5%, you're assessed at 5.75. So they're building in the fat. Correct, yeah. Now, if you're not able to pass that assessment easily, my suggestion is to step back, take a stronger look, a clearer look at your portfolio and your financial circumstances before you jump in. Uh, Otherwise, what will happen is that you would then have to be forced to sell down and again on a higher interest rate climate. And when you're forced to sell, usually not able to get 
a good outcome for yourself and it may not line up perfectly to debt reduction or to actually getting the fruits of your hard labor. So this is where I think the trap is in this low interest rate environment is because I think just subconsciously people will think, well, the cost of money is now as low as we've ever seen it and the spread, as you talk about, Victor, between the the cost of money and the, the gross rent is getting wider and wider and wider, so therefore I might spend a little bit more on the asset selection piece and, mm-hmm. and go perhaps blue chip mm-hmm. or you know million dollar property whatever it may be and just forget about the cash flow scenario at the moment because the cost of money is so cheap and I can afford it but as Vic said it doesn't take a lot of time for interest rates to turn around while mm-hmm. we might talk around well rates aren't going to go up for the next five years or whatever it may be once it starts to go up it's not a gradual you know, crawl of increments it's usually quite quick because it's faster than the cuts it's faster than the cuts because the inflation's going up mm-hmm. and all the other metrics and so they need to arrest that quite quickly a little bit like they are now mm-hmm. with a blunt hammer approach and just saying let's reduce 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 and i think this is the trap this this particular moment in time could be quite dangerous for a lot of people isn't there an argument to say though because banks have been assessing people's mortgages at 7.29 or 7.3 percent that property investment is largely idiot proof because someone else is doing all the responsible bit for you therefore if you're able to get a mortgage you should be all right no yes and no we need to make sure that we're not looking at this in isolation, right? So we need to be looking at the financial habits of the investor, of the person, because it's not just buying the property. It's what else are you doing with the money? Uh, If your interest rates are low and you've been able to afford the repayments at the higher interest rates, the suggestion is that now's the time to, to seriously consider some debt reduction. Channel the extra money back into the mortgages to start paying them down so that when the rates do go up, you're at a lower LVR. And you're in an awesome position because that's something that the the people haven't talked about a lot is that debt reduction piece and, you know, without putting an economist's hat on, but that will also have a significant effect upon the economy as well because if you look at P&I rates now, I saw 2.98 on, mm-hmm. your, on your owner-occupied place the other day, which is just it's cheap. awesome rate, yeah. isn't it? It's very, very cheap. But it's P&I, and if we even rewind back a little bit further to the initial APRA changes where they tried to balance the books and offer cheaper P&I rates... What many people, what the economists perhaps didn't take into account was just how much money that sucked out of the society because it was going into the mortgage as opposed mm-hmm. to into people's pockets to spend and you know, mm-hmm. retriculate back through the economy. And that could potentially be the same thing all over again. Once again, 2.98 P&I rates. So you say, so we, we, what we're doing, we're, we're sort of in between now the strategy of property investing and the tactics of property investing. So mm-hmm. what you're saying, Victor, is that if you got assessed at 7.29% by the bank and they've said, you know, Mr. Kumar, you can afford that, you should probably pay off your mortgage at 7.29% rather than the 3.5% you're getting, right? Mm. So you're you're chucking in cash, you're driving down your debt position, you're increasing the LVR, you're reducing your, your potentially your interest rate payments. But what you're saying, Steve, is that by doing that, you're sucking money out of the economy that would be elsewhere. So it's, you know, counter-cyclical to- Could be what, counterproductive. Counterproductive to yeah. what people are trying to achieve. Well, I think so. You know, as long as that's done on mass scale, of course. Mm. And so once again, that'll store the economy potentially, and that's not me with an economist hat on. But if you do decide to keep paying down debt at the 7%, just for argument's sake, make sure that it's liquid. Like be mm, yeah. diligent and uh, disciplined so enough you're to about, offsets. So you're talking about offsets, right? Yeah, so, you, so you can use that money at any point. So let, let's just touch on that quickly, Victor. What is an offset account? We're talking about tactics here, so sure. what is it? So uh, essentially an offset account is a savings account attached to a mortgage where it, as the name suggests, offsets the interest that can be charged on the mortgage by the same amount that you have in your savings account. So as an example, if you've got, say, $20,000 sitting in your offset account, they'll charge interest on the principal amount less than 20000 that you owe them. Understand that with most banks, though, it does not change your repayments. What it does is it changes the payments into a principal payment instead of the interest payment. So your payments remain the same, it's just that you're paying it off faster because you're paying it less interest. I think it's one of the most powerful it is. tools mm. in terms of you know, debt reduction and, and cash flow management that there is. So, but if you're on a, only an interest only mortgage, mm-hmm. it reduces your actual it interest does. payment. Yeah, it does. So, but if you're on principal and interest, it just goes, you know, rather than channeling part of the money into uh, the interest component, part into the principal, it just puts more in the principal, cover the interest up. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. And and is this a, a tactic for, for property investors or more of an owner-occupier thing? Look, I, I would say that if you've got plans to pay down your mortgage, this is a very powerful tool both for investors and homeowners. 
our literature, our seminars, our education around investing has always been to pay off the non-tax deductible debt. And that is because our focus with most educators has always been in tax minimization. I'm a big advocate of debt minimization. So try and pay off your debt as quickly as possible. Mm. But you need to obviously sit back, take some advice on which mortgage to attack first, whether it is your own occupied mortgage or whether you go contrary to it and actually pay down your investment debt first so that you free up the income attached to that investment. That is an individual choice and you should take advice on that. So we're chatting about how, because of the serviceability rates, subsequent to where we are today, was was a lot higher, now it's down a lot more. Capacity of people to channel greater funds into paying off debt because of this result. And the fact that because people have been ser- assessed at a serviceability rate well above where the mortgage rates are, that a lot of the responsibility has been removed around whether or not you yep. should invest in property. Okay, that's, that's fair enough. What else should you be doing though? Because I think you shouldn't be outsourcing responsibility to anyone else other than yourself for your ability to be a property investor. So a lot of people go wrong. Tactics, tools for people who want to make sure they're making more informed decisions around investing in property given this current market. And it's a volatile market. Mm -hmm. We've spoken about whether or not it's counterproductive to the economy or whether it is productive to the economy. We know there's still uncertainty here. We don't know what will happen in interest rates and when it might happen. So what do you got to get right? Right well, now, Victor. I, I think the first thing is get your fundamentals right in the sense that have a look at your statements when they come in. And I'm talking about your mortgage statements. And you'd be surprised as to, I sit down with a lot of clients and they would be saying one thing in terms of what, where the interest rates are and when the physical considerably the statement yeah. is, is there, they realize that they're actually 1% higher than what they thought it was. So do some basic housekeeping. Have a look at what rates you're paying. Go back to the banks, pick up the phone, make that phone call, say, I need a cheaper rate. I'm a victim of that. I like, practice what I preach, not what I do. I, I looked at one of my mortgage statements the other day and I'm actually at 5.14 on one of the mortgages. Mm-hmm. And it was just, I've got stuff well above five still until yeah. I get out of, you know. Yeah, but your stuff is second tier lenders. Mm. No, they're not. Aren't they? No. Was that with a mainstream? Oh, uh, they're with non-major banks. Well, so well, yeah, I'm, okay. Mine was well, with the major. Okay, and it was just ridiculous. So I, hundred percent, like mm. it. You don't know what you don't know, and and this is why we're such massive fans of constant reviewing. And and part of your advisory panel is to actually sit down and go so through. Where you got to start then? Start there. If you don't know what interest, rate, if you don't know, if you listen to this, and you don't know what your interest rates are. Absolutely guaranteed, you've got to start there. <laughs> and your rents and your <laughs> yeah, rents yes. on the other on the other side of it. Yeah, uh, yeah. and while we might, yeah say that in jest, I would say 70% of people don't know what their rates are. I'd probably one of them. I'm looking right at you. (laughs) There's some problem I'm going, is there actually anyone in that at the moment? I I don't know. That's bad. But that's, look, it is, it is because, well, your portfolio is now larger, but for the Mm. people with one or two or three properties, you know, you are massively emotionally involved. There's in still, still no excuse though not to know. No, there's not. Really. I'm just trying to make you feel better no, about don't, yourself. Don't. Yeah. Make me feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> just means I've got to do something about it. But, you know, I'm, I'm reflective of a lot of people who invest in property. You know, yeah. the, one of the, and a point that you make time and time again, Steve, is that people think um, property is a passive investment. So once mm. you buy a property, you don't have to worry about it. And that is completely not the way it is. You need to be right Never. across it all the time. Never has been. I just want to go back to what something Victor said earlier on and, and you feel about while the rates are, so much lower than what they were six months, 12 months ago, and that potentially it might drive prices up and that rates will eventually Mm -hmm. go up. When rates are higher and rates start to fall, people automatically start to feel better about themselves because they've got more cash in their pocket. So they already know that, you know, argument's sake, their rates at 6% and it's dropped to 5.5, there's a benefit there for them. So they're not as perhaps in tune with the costings of their portfolio or their life as it is. But when rates are 3.5% or 3.9% or whatever it may be and getting lower, eventually the tables will turn or the tide will turn and they'll start to increase again. But they're so used to uh, an income and expenditure ratio at the lower amount, they're suddenly struggling. suddenly as it increases, it means so much more to them than it does when it's the opposite and they start from a higher end rate to, to, to start to So you're talking about preparing for the future. Should people's time horizon be five years away, Victor, of, you know, what their income expenditure, cash flow position is going to be in five years' time and what interest rates might look, be I, then? I, I think you really need to look at it in one year, three years and five years uh, in that order because um, if you look at it in five years' time, there's no time pressure, mm. right? So you'd eventually get to it. Whereas if you look at it in smaller time units, it does put the time pressure on you, so you actually get some action happening. 
and actually pick up the phone and call the bank or actually start physically reviewing your portfolio. And I don't think it's only limited to your property portfolio. With the lower interest rate, therefore a lot more surplus cash left over in any household, we really need to look at all of our outgoings. This is the time where you really need to go back through your budget and have a look at, okay, that insurance policy, have we reviewed that? Is it cheaper now? That um, property management, have we reviewed that? Our car insurance, have we reviewed that? I mean, you start saving money that way because what happens is as you have more surplus cash, you tend to start changing your spending habits and you start spending and you start using up that money. Mm -hmm. And then when the money starts drying up, that's when the forced sales or the distressed refinances start happening and you get into loan products that might not be totally suitable for your strategy with that particular property. Or you might have to then tack on extra loans onto your home because you spent all the money that was readily available without uh, doing any housekeeping. And some of those loan products, and we've talked about that quite a lot you know, in person with clients, is some of the, perhaps those third tier lenders that, you can obtain finance with because you can't obtain finance with the majors. But once they've got you, they've got you. And when the rates start to go down as they are now, theirs don't because what are your options? Mm. And so going into these products, I think you need to go Mm. with your eyes wide open and know that they are a short, well, they should be a short-term play. So as soon as you can get out of them into a mainstream, it's going to be far more advantageous for you. I think, you know, everyone's talking about cash flow properties and and cash flow positive properties and all that. This is the time for cash flow management rather than tilting towards, you know, having a cash flow positive portfolio. It is good to have a cash flow positive portfolio, but it boils down to cash flow management first before you even start looking at anything else. Mm. So what's happening in the markets then? You know, we're talking about cash flow management and the need to, don't be overzealous at the moment, seeing that Money's as so cheap as it's going to get. So maybe this is the time. Do you, do you go have your European holiday right now when uh, when you can afford it, Steve? Is that the right thing to do? As long as it's not borrowed money. As long as it's not borrowed money. So yeah. this is good debt and bad debt, which we've covered before, right? That's yeah. probably bad debt, right? So don't refinance your mortgage and, and go on a massive holiday or? Never use borrowed money for an experience. It doesn't last very long. But I think, look, the markets are quite dynamic at the moment. There's because people are always going to ask, you know, this is the feedback we get is, you know, we, we talk a lot of the theory and the fundamentals of property investing. People don't know, okay, that's great. What do we do about it? Well, I think we've given some pretty good, what do you do about cash flow management in this particular market? And to your point, Victor, I think paying down debt when you can, I think mm-hmm. that's, that makes a lot of sense. So everyone should be considering that particular strategy. And that might just be to beef up your LVR position. So at a point in time, you can refinance and, and invest in a new property based on your ability to do so. So people always go, all right, that's great. Where do I invest? Now, I read a thing the other day, the media, talking about the media, some media is good, some media is not so good. Uh, this is obviously the good media. Mm. I guess it's media, isn't well, it? You know, obviously. Given, you know, good information that Brisbane's the place to be. There's By 2022, it probably is going to go up there from now to then by 25%. What do you reckon? Oh, that's a big call. Look, it has – the potential, but Brisbane's had the potential for quite some time. Mm. Um, just as it seems to get going, it's had some major stalls, which across the whole economy throughout Australia, whether it be lending or whether it be you know, unemployment and what have you. So it's it's been unlucky, but its major issue that it's had has been jobs creation or, or local jobs, but hopefully that's starting to turn around now. They've got some major infrastructure spend in and around the Brisbane region, and that should create jobs. But Ultimately, it will come down to the local jobs scenario because at the end of the day, that's what's needed to drive the economy. Potentially, it'll have the 20%, but I don't think it's the only place in Australia to be investing. There's there's several other markets. Mm-hmm. We're across literally six. And it does come back down to budgets and capital, borrowing capacity. And the time frame. Cash flow tolerance time frame. But it's got potential. But so too does certain areas of Sydney, certain areas of Melbourne, certain areas of Adelaide. Um, I think that what it highlights is that, again, it's the media headlines that are tending to dictate a few things. So if we stick to the fundamentals, if we stick to the plan of tech in terms of how your portfolio is unfolding, then it doesn't really matter where you're buying within reason, of course, so long as we've addressed the fundamentals and it is within our means to hold onto the property long term and uh, buy in areas that have got infrastructure going in, demand, supply and demand imbalance, and also making sure that the property or properties that you buy is across 
many different markets. So it's not just Brisbane centric or Sydney centric or Melbourne centric. That way, we're not hanging our hat on a, a newspaper headline to say that it's going to go up by 20% because we were playing inside, let in this example, in three different markets. So you know, Brisbane, Sydney, and Melbourne. Mm. And they all move in different cycles. They all have different attributes uh, in terms of cash flow. And they all have different growth spurts, depending on if you're looking at Brisbane at the moment, the growth spurt is likely to happen because massive infrastructure dollar spent in their state budget this year, which is the biggest dollar amount since the Peter Beatty days. So that's 20 years since they've spent this much money on infrastructure. And the focus also is on employment. And you overlay that with the fact that at the moment, Brisbane has got the largest inter and intra my, uh, straight migration. So typically, um, depending on which stats you look at, 1,200 new people going in per week into the it's Brisbane much, market. Is that is huge. Yeah, It has surpassed Melbourne. Melbourne last year was 1,100 people going in per week. Oh, wow. There you go. Is it, so the question is, I put it to you a couple of months ago, Victor, is it a good time to invest in property? Yes, it is. I'll, I'll stand by my words. I had said that this is by far the best time in the last It's gone decade. backwards. See, it was uh, the best. Now it's only good. Yeah. Uh, it's a the, reasonable time. Yeah. <laughs> Stop putting words in my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> now, it is absolutely by far the best time to invest in the last decade. The reason being that low interest rates, finance is getting easier. There is still a little bit of uncertainty in people's minds and they haven't been able to really push forward with their finance because they're not as prepared. So we've got a gap in the market where there are less buyers in the market in the key areas. So once you assess whether it is the right property and the right area to get into, certainly it is a really good time to invest. Well, you've teamed me up, um, Victor, for our question for this month. Um, and remember, send your questions to questions at rightpropertygroup.com.au and we will get to them. We're actually going to do just a full Q&A episode in a couple of months' time to cover off all the stuff that we're getting. But this is from Leanne W. And uh, direct this one to you, Steve. Leanne writes that she saw a thing from Core Logic a couple of months ago that said, you know, the speed down to get to the bottom of the market, so the time taken is about the same time to go back up. So this cycle is taking about a year and a half to get to, a year and a half to two years to get down to where we are. Is it going to be the same speed to get up to it? So she's asking, are we at the bottom and do we need to wait that long in order for properties to get back to where they should be? Oh, good question. I'm going to be, have an each way answer on this. I think it depends. I think some areas will continue to, well, sorry, some areas at the moment seem to have bottomed, but I think they'll go sideways and might even contract a little bit more in some areas. Where's uh, those sums, you reckon? Well, I think it'll be around certain parts of Sydney and Melbourne, the high-rise units, yep. uh, where there's obviously some negative sentiment and consumer. They're all going to fall down at some point. Well, they're all going to fall down and, and so are the prices. And there's an oversupply. So I think that that'll continue to contract. In the same area, call it Sydney, I think there'll be certain areas with the larger blocks of land that represent good value will be starting or have bottomed out and we're already starting to see them ebb forward. Mm. Brisbane, pretty much the same thing, mm-hmm. although the, the inner city markets throughout there- A lot uh, of apartments still there. Well, there were a lot of apartments mm. and there was a lot of oversupply, but that's been absorbed now and they're starting to see increases in that inner city precinct around apartments. So that would suggest that you know, suppliers now met demand. Mm. But once again, with the Brisbane CBD, I've never been a massive fan of it purely because they can build, or any CBD for that matter, because they can build up very quickly when it comes to high-rise. So the outer rings, Adelaide, I think, will continue to chug along. Adelaide and Brisbane were quite resilient during the downturn. When you look at the... They didn't shift very much. No, if you look at the contraction of other markets and then look at theirs, they were quite resilient. Mm. And so I think Adelaide will continue to do that. And there's some pretty good news around there with employment and jobs and infrastructure. WA is probably the the one that is on one side of the ledger is showing some positive signs and on the other side of the ledger, yeah, it's got some horrific falls still happening, whether that be in price or, or, or yields. And Tassie, as we said probably a year ago now, we've been saying to our clients who purchased there to probably take advantage of the high prices, sell, think or consider it, do your numbers. So it's okay to sell, Victor. It's right it is absolutely sell. okay to yeah. sell. Yep. Yep. Provided you're selling towards a plan mm. of that That's, reduction yeah. or, or lifestyle need. It needs to be quite deliberate and in consultation with your accountant and what have you because at the end of the day, just sort of getting off this, the question for a minute, the ultimate goal is to have zero debt. Well, that's our strategy anyway, mm. to have zero debt on your portfolio. Heaps of assets with no debt. 
Yeah. And so sometimes you've got to sell properties to pay off other properties. That's just a yeah, part of it. But I think, look, just coming back to the question, I think the year and a half to get to the bottom and a year and a half to, to see some price movement, that's, that's quite relevant. And I think in some cases that will be the It just depends the where you're doing. So you need to look at the numbers. You need to probably get down to a suburb level, let alone a state level or a capital city Well, I level. think, yeah, 100%, because in yeah. further from what Vic said earlier on about being the best time ever to invest throughout the country. And like I think, as I said before, in a couple of episodes ago, I think some areas it is really, really good and in some areas I think there'll be some pain. So, so in 20 years' time, Victor, is everyone going to be talking about, oh, that's so good back there in 2019 when- In uh, 20 years' time, they'll be saying, look, I listened to Victor on this podcast. He said it was the best time to buy. I bought and I bought really well using some really good fundamentals and look at me now sitting in the Bahamas. You, are you the, uh, are you, manufa- are you, man- are, are you manufacturing the next generation of millionaires? Yeah, that's right. right. <laughs> Where, where's that's his next be? book. Yeah. Yeah. Next gen millionaire. Ooh, next well, gen I millionaire. I like that. Yeah. Quick, write it down. It's, so you, no, can, look, you can become a bazillionaire through investing in property. That's what the spruit is. Gazillion. Not bazillion. A gazillion. Yeah. Gazillion. Yeah. A gazillion. Yeah. A gazillion. Yeah. A gazillion. I think when you're talking 20 years, all jokes aside, right? Most people, if you look at the statistics, most people sell their property within three and a half years of ownership, yeah. right? That is 80% of people sell within three and a half years of ownership. The reasoning behind that is twofold. One, they haven't done their sums correctly. They bought in a low interest rate climate, interest rates start climbing, they haven't done their budgets, they find it cramps their lifestyle, so they sell. Or they have bought in a, say, Brisbane market, expecting a Sydney property cycle yeah. and therefore say this property has not done anything and they offload just before dawn, just before the prices start going up because they've been impatient. The reality is that property is a medium to long-term investment and whilst you do get you know, quite significant short-term gains, look at the Sydney market, you also give it back as well, quite significantly as well. So it's important that we look at it from a long-term perspective and it's important also not to try and time the market, but more so be in the market. Look, if you can time it or have some degree mm. of timing, it, it really goes a long way. Well, this way. goes back to, to, to mm. Leanne's question there around, time. she's thinking about timing the market. Now, you never ever time the bottom perfectly. It's only in hindsight you can go, you know what, plus that was or minus about a month after I, I hit that pretty Yeah, well. it was more luck than good management. More, more luck than good management. Yeah. But you can, there is enough science and intelligence around to, to look to time the market, plus or minus, even if you're six months within it, you, you're not going to go wrong. Yeah, it depends months. on the run of the market the run of the market and how long it mm, goes for. Mm. But I think I think in this environment to which we're starting to move into, I think asset selection, and that means where as well, is probably more important than what it was when rates were at 5%. Correct. Because Correct. there could potentially be dead cat bounces and there could be you know, false positives throughout the market. And if you buy incorrectly, so once again coming back to the whole cash flow management piece, if you're taking on a very, very low – gross yield now, whilst we have a very low cost of money, it will bite you in the medium term. So questions at rightpropergroup.com.au, send them through. And uh, Leanne, thanks for uh, getting in touch and sending that over. Uh, It's really good. Now, Victor, I spoke about this at the start of the podcast. You've got something for our listeners called your infamous portfolio tracker. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so this is this is something that I've used and Steve has used to track our own portfolio. Something whilst we've got other sophisticated software that we use to manage the portfolio, this is to track the numbers of the portfolio. And it is a a spreadsheet that we've spent years fine tuning so that you could plug in all of your numbers and track your portfolio. So it gives you on two levels the live figure as to your up to date cost of running a property or the whole portfolio and then also a notional figure of if you've had you know no vacancies and your rates are x this is what the entire portfolio is going to cost you okay i think but to be fair this isn't well this is an extremely important tool and mm. we use it with all of our clients and the way that we help manage their portfolios not as a property manager but as a portfolio manager mm. but to be fair this isn't a glammed up pretty piece of software. It's a workable tool. It's a workable tool. It's a worksheet, yeah. essentially. So there's no graphs or anything like that. It's supposed to elaborate a little bit more from what Vic said. It it shows your monthly P&Ls, mm. um, therefore live, as Victor said it. It gives you a projected or a um, retrospective look at the portfolio per property and then from a portfolio point of view, it gives a general overview of how the property looks today in terms of its income and expenditure and 
also when you purchase it. So this is pretty it. important. So if, if you're struggling, I know a lot of people do struggle with how do I go about documenting my This is just layout. a very simple way to okay. track it because uh, you can be as sophisticated as you want. You can play with the formulas, go mm-hmm. knock yourself out, but this yeah. is just a very simple way to know where you are and where you're going. How do you get your hands on this, Victor? Well, we'll put the link in the show notes or you can send us an email, questions at rightpropertygroup.com.au and put the word spreadsheet on the subject and we'll send it out to you. All right, sounds good. And just on a final note with that, usually we have that as a live version, but in this particular case, we'll just send it out as an Excel sheet. Yep. Okay. Sounds like a good tool. Um, questions at rightpropertygroup.com.au. Just put spreadsheet in the subject field and uh, put your details in there and the guys will send it over. That's a good podcast. Enjoy it. I feel Excellent. buoyed and optimistic about the future. Can you get on top of your stuff? No. See you in 20 <laughs> years, Tom. I need, <laughs> I, need, I need a good planning tool to help me out with this. But, you know, like to, to be fair, like tools like that are really, really important, but it's, it's only as good as your effort and attention into putting information into it to get the science that you want out of it. So, And it does, it does take time. Like if you look time. at your portfolio, it, it could take hours yeah. every month if you Particularly have to Particularly if you neglect it. If you keep up with it, it's easy. If you the, neglect it, it's hard. The longer you neglect it, the more it, it takes you. Yeah. Look, we, we estimate probably a decent you know, four or five properties or something. That'll be a couple of hours a month. Yeah, mm-hmm. which is not too onerous. Get yourself a glass of wine and enjoy the, enjoy the ride. When you've got a couple of million out there, a couple of hours a month, it's not a great deal to nah, ask for, right? It's, it's all right. But uh, no, thank you, guys. I really appreciate your time for coming in. And I trust everyone uh, enjoy that podcast. You know, it's good to be a property investor. It's always good to be a property investor. It's just about how you inform and educate yourself in any given time to make sure you're making the most informed decisions. So uh, there's plenty of other podcasts, Investing Insights with the Right Property Group. Go and check them out uh, wherever you're listening to us here. Uh, this is into our third series. Third season. So we're nearly up to three years with this thing. Wow, who would have thought? Not with you as a host. Oh, no. <laughs> Ten minutes. <laughs> Surprise! I haven't been dumped yet, but I must be doing something right. Anyway, uh, we'll be back again next time. Until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature, does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs, and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property, or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you.